Show. Hello, welcome back to the Bird Show. We have a very fun episode planned. I am joined again today by Luca, the blue and gold macaw. We are going to be talking about one of my favorite birds. They are one of the most architectural, creative interior designers in all of the bird world, and they are called Bowerbirds. Bowerbirds do not refer to bowing or curtsying or anything like that. A bower is actually a type of structure that bower birds build. So <laughs> there are 20 species of bower bird. They range quite a great deal in size. The smallest is called the golden bower bird. It's only 22 centimeters or 8.7 inches long. And that's half the size of the biggest, which is the great bower bird which measures at 40 centimeters or 16 inches long. So a great deal of size difference between the 20 species of bowerbird. 10 species of bowerbird are native to New Guinea, while eight are endemic to Australia, and two of those species can be found both in New Guinea and Australia. Bowerbirds occupy a wide range of habitats. This includes rainforest, eucalyptus, and acacia forests, as well as shrublands. The Ilorodes ah. catbirds, which are named because of their call, which sounds like a cat meowing, ah. uh, they're the only monogamous species of bowerbird. The rest are definitely polygamous, ah. with the female building the nest and having to raise the young alone, unfortunately. The catbirds, on the other hand, both the male and the female will go ahead and ah. raise the young together. Bowerbirds are often dimorphic, meaning that the males have feathers that are a lot brighter than the female bowerbirds. Although I've seen some female bowerbird species with the most beautiful striking eyes. Their eyes are this piercing blue, almost a lavender color. It's quite beautiful. I encourage you to look up bowerbirds in your free time if you want to have not only some entertainment in terms of interior design, but also some amazing courtship dances, and you can see those beautiful blue peepers. Female bowerbirds, when they're building their nest, they don't actually build them in the bower. The bower is just to attract the females. What they'll do is they'll put soft materials like leaves and ferns and even some vine tendrils ah. and they'll put them on top of a loose ah. foundation of sticks. Then they'll lay ah. one big egg if they're the Papua New Guinean species, whereas ah. those that live in Australia will lay more. They'll lay up to three ah. eggs and these tend to have a couple days spacing in between them. The eggs of bowerbirds are quite big, especially compared to their body size. And bowerbirds, as a group, have the longest life expectancy of any passerine. So the two most studied species, the green catbird and the satin bowerbird, have life expectancies of around 8 to 10 years. And one satin bowerbird actually lived to the ripe old age of 26. So being a long-lived species is something that bowerbirds have in common with parrots, like my co-host Luca here. Enough beating around the bower bird bush. Let's get talking about some of those amazing bowers. So bowers refer to these big stick-like structures that the bower birds will then decorate. There's two types of bowers. The first is called a maypole bower, and it's named that because the bower bird will construct his bower around a sapling or a small tree. And he'll use that as sort of like the center of his architectural masterpiece. And around that, he can build a round structure of sticks. The second type of bower, after the maypole bower, is called an avenue type, which is constructed of twigs that are put vertically in the ground and they make almost like grass where it's a hollowed out center area in the middle, but otherwise it's an alleyway that they've constructed using sticks. Once he's finished building that, he'll begin to decorate it with things that he finds around his habitat. Anything shiny, anything colorful is up for grabs, and it varies a lot individual to individual. Each bower bird has his own unique style, 
and his own list of favorite things to collect. So once the bowerbird has collected these shiny or colorful items, and these could be anything from shells, leaves, flowers, feathers, <laughs> stones, berries, and even discarded man-made items like colorful bits of plastic, coins, nails. They've been known to collect rifle shells um, and pieces of glass. So really, if it has an aesthetic appeal and if it seems to attract the ladies, bowerbirds are likely to want to collect them. They'll spend hours upon hours arranging so delicately their precious items inside of their bowers. If you've ever seen a documentary about bowerbirds, then you've had the delightful experience of watching a male bowerbird adjust ah. ever so minutely where each twig goes and where each shiny object goes. And if one berry ah. sort of falls off the pile, he's very astute and will immediately pick it back up and put it precisely where it's supposed to go. That's not to say that some bowerbirds aren't uh, a little bit more of an opportunist and maybe take some of their creative cues from their neighbors. Bowerbirds have been known to steal the items in their neighbor's bowers which, uh, in my opinion, is much less romantic from a female bowerbird's perspective than creating your own original work of art and doing all the elbow grease it takes to collect that stuff yourself. Looking at a bowerbird's bower can give you an indication of what kind of resources are available in that area. So not only are there individual preferences in terms of what that particular male is attracted to, maybe shiny things, maybe red things, blue things, there's also just opportunity. So if it's a very mossy forest, you may see one with a bunch of moss. If it's a forest with a lot of rocks, then you may see a very artfully crafted rock display in that male's bower. The bowerbird males, the once they've put the finishing touches on their masterpiece and the female bowerbirds come to check it out, the males will put on this amazing courtship display. And this varies widely from species to species. Sometimes it looks like uh, erratic movement. Sometimes it looks like a graceful dance, but it definitely catches the attention of females. That's for sure. A lot of guys are more seasoned than others. And there's some males whose moves and whose collections don't really strike the ladies fancy. When they do studies of bowerbirds, they find that there's usually a couple guys who have the best stuff and the best moves and they get almost all the ladies and other guys meanwhile no matter how much they polish their rock collection end up really getting with nobody the entire mating season which is kind of a bummer if you put in that much energy <laughs> into building your bower interestingly those alorotus ah. catbirds the ones that i mentioned earlier that are the only monogamous ah. type they are the only species which do not construct either bowers or display areas, and presumably this is because they're spending their time building and courting in their actual nest. So one last interesting thing about bowerbirds before we move on is that many species are known to be superb vocal mimics, similar to my friend Luca here, who can say quite a few words in both macaw and human. The McGregor's bowerbird, for example, has been observed imitating pigs, waterfalls, and also human chatter. And satin bowerbirds commonly mimic other local species as part of their courtship display. So that's a little bit of an overview about bowerbirds. If you get a chance to ever watch a documentary with them, I highly recommend it because they are fascinating birds to watch. They captured the imagination of Charles Darwin, who mentioned both them and Birds of Paradise in his original writings about bird species. And it's no wonder because they really have a reputation for not only being creative, having individualistic flair, but also uh these amazing and intricate courtship displays. And so I would say bowerbirds are among some of the greatest artists in the entire avian kingdom. Except for you, Luca. You are quite creative. So that's an overview about bowerbirds. For today's bird tale, we're gonna do something a little bit different and we're going to have our first filmed feature and it's going to be building our own bower with Luca starring as our main male bower bird 
and Chipmunk, the Americana Chicken, will make her film actress debut playing female bowerbird number one. So coming up is our bird tale. Bird tales. Here we are in the forest with our majestic bowerbird. This is a male of the species and he's scoping out his territory for the perfect place to build his maypole bower. This spot will do. Yes, this spot will be perfect for him to build his bower and attract a mate. The first step in building a proper bower is you must get the goodest sticks in the forest. I'm not talking those mediocre sticks. I'm talking high quality sticks of the highest order. Sometimes your sticks are going to be a little too long. You're going to have to trim them down to size. Once he's got his sticks in order, the male bowerbird works quickly to construct the outer architecture that will hold his final design. There, that's perfect. Now it's time to get some brightly colored objects and to start collecting. He begins with the brightest flowers he can find in the forest. Then he moves on to something a little bit bigger. Here, this pine cone should do. This is coming along quite nicely. Let's finish it up with some stones, and let's even add a little bit of lichen for color. He realizes something's missing. That's it. How about a good snack for the ladies? Now his bower is perfect and complete with the final finishing touches. What? What's that? There's a female bowerbird traipsing through the forest. Let's take a moment to be quiet while she checks out our male bowerbird's bower. To entice the female in further, he begins his exotic display of dancing and singing. She can't resist his chatter. She comes in for a closer look. Yes, that's it. It appears she likes what she sees. Ah, but just when he gets his hopes up, another male bowerbird in the forest attracts the female's attention, and off she goes to check out his collection in his bower. Tough break, my bowerbird friend. Better luck next time. If you're listening to this as a podcast and you can't see our bower, Make sure you check us out on YouTube. I'll leave a link in the description for today's show. You have a good day. Welcome back to the bird show. I hope you enjoyed our bird tales. I know we had a lot of fun building our bower together, although it was a lot harder than it looks when the bower birds do it on TV. So they definitely make it look easy. And I have a newfound respect for bower birds. And I think Luca here probably feels the same way, especially finding all those sticks, the right length sticks, and not knocking over your bower on accident when you're trying to build it. So now that we've had our bird tails, let's move on to the flocking news. The flocking news. Today's flocking news article was published a little while ago. It was actually published last year in 2019. But I thought it was really important to bring today because the name is Golden Bowerbird's Building Prowess Helps Scientists Monitor Climate Change and Alarm Bells Are Ringing. We mentioned here on the Bird Show concern for the environment, what's happening to bird habitats around the world. And so even though this article is a little older than those we usually pick for the flocking news, I think the message still rings true now, perhaps even more than ever. This article was written by Emma Soison, and it was published by the ABC Mid-North Coast. The article mainly talks about that smallest species of bowerbird that I mentioned at the beginning of the bird show, the golden bowerbird. It's the smallest of 10 species of bowerbirds in Australia, and yet it builds the largest bowers. The towering maypole-style structures can rise to three meters and are constructed around two trees. The giant bowers are then maintained in the same place for decades. 
Our studies show that some golden bowerbird bowers will persist for up to 40 years in the same spot, generation after generation take over the bowers, ornithologist Dr. Clifford Firth said. The golden bowerbird's bowers are helping researchers monitor the species as part of climate change studies. Professor Stephen Williams from the College of Science and Engineering at Townsville's James Cook University said the golden bowerbird lived in the highland rainforests of northeast Queensland. For many years, he has been monitoring the bowerbirds, as well as other Australian highland rainforest species that are restricted to small, high-altitude areas. They've adapted to wet, tropical mountaintops. As the temperature increases, it pushes them up the mountain, and they literally have nowhere to go, he said. In 2005, a climate change conference in the United Kingdom was told that even a one degree Celsius temperature rise would put birds like the Australian golden bowerbird under pressure. Professor Williams said climate change predictions made more than a decade ago were now becoming a reality. We now have quite solid data acquired over the last 15 years that some of these species are contracting quite severely and very much in line with what we were predicting about 10 years ago based on the models. It's actually happening now, he said. I go out in the field to places I've been to in the last 15 years where I used to see 50 animals in an hour. And I go there now and I see only six or seven. First of all, I think that's amazing that one of the smallest bower birds makes the biggest bower. And how incredible is it that they pass those on from generation to generation? I can only imagine the neighbor's envy when you have the biggest bower mansion in the whole forest. I'm sure that whoever is the male in charge in any given year probably has to keep his defenses up so nobody swipes his digs. But the fact that these bowers have been there for sometimes up to 40 years and they were capable of being used by the same species of bower birds and now all of a sudden they're being vacated and these poor birds are having to move higher up the mountain and start from scratch. When the bower birds are forced to move to higher altitudes, like the scientist said, there's only so high that they can go. It's amazing how such a small degree change in our atmosphere can have such huge consequences and ripple effects for the species that we share the earth with. These bower birds, even though they're so small, they send such a huge message by leaving these giant, beautiful, ornate structures behind that they vacate when they have to move to higher ground. And that's assuming that they've moved and that they haven't perished as a result of the lack of resources and or ability to find a mate and others of their own species. So it's hard out there for bower birds and it's getting increasingly hard as the climate continues to get hotter. I would hate to see for the creativity of the bower birds to be lost for future generations and I can only imagine how magical it was for some of the first people to come upon bowers in the forest, not knowing perhaps who their architects were and the magic of creativity that they bring to the forest is unparalleled and would never be able to be ah. replaced. So I really hope for the bower bird's sake and for our own sake that we can figure out a way to remedy some of the things that we're doing to the planet with regard to climate change. We are all connected after all, which we can see now more than ever. The actions that we take in our own backyards, in our own countries, in our day-to-day -day lives can have an impact on birds collecting shells, collecting seeds and berries in a forest on the other side of the world. That's today's Flocking News article. Let's end it with a bird of advice. A bird of advice. So if there's one thing that bower birds have taught me, it's that you should celebrate uniqueness. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to express yourself. Don't be afraid to say, you know what? Blue is my favorite color. I'm gonna collect everything blue and I'm gonna make the most beautiful thing out of the color blue. I think it's critical now more than ever in times that can be stressful to really stay true to your vision of beauty and your own unique way of expressing it. 
I know there's a few bower birds who <laughs> tend to steal from their neighbors and plagiarize others' artwork. Try not to be that guy, you know? Try to be the one who paints with his own brush, who expresses themselves without abandon, and who dances in celebration of their art. Not everyone even has to have the same points of view or even ways of seeing. We can all express our vision of beauty in our own unique ways. And in doing so, we can paint a rainbow of beauty in the forest. The metaphorical forest, as well as the actual forest where bowerbirds live. <laughs> That's it for the bird show. I hope to see you next week. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a donation to the Carulos Center for Nonviolence at www.carulos.org. And if you have a chance, take a listen to another podcast that's on our network. It's called Being Sanctuary, hosted by Lauren Bailey, and it is amazing. I highly recommend it. It's one of the best ways that I've found to keep calm during these crazy times, and Luca, <laughs> he loves it too. So check out Being Sanctuary. Go to www.carulos.org, and we will see you next week on The Bird Show. Until then, please do have a flocking good time. <laughs>